You're listening to I Can't Have Children, Now What? From Tutum Global, hosted by Joby Tyson. If you're seeking answers about infertility and childlessness, this is the podcast for you, using research and lived experiences to solve history's infertility medical mysteries, while courageously taking you behind closed doors to face the question mark for one in five women sharing the same dilemma. I can't have children. Now what? From Tutum Global in Atlanta, this is I Can't Have Children, Now What? I'm your host, Joby Tyson. You know, there are a series of milestones that global society views as steps a female takes toward full-fledged womanhood. The first stage starts with the wearing of a bra, then goes on to the beginning of menstruation as a girl, which supposedly enables her to reproduce. Then in no particular order, there's makeup, a driver's license, losing virginity, perhaps getting a degree, finding a job, and then the real clinchers, marriage and children. So from childhood to adulthood, it's ingrained in our brains that motherhood weighs the heaviest in our definition of womanhood. Not to mention that most narratives of women who struggle with infertility result in a child. However, for millions of women throughout the world, infertility does not result in a child, leaving them feeling excluded and left to fend for themselves. But the I Can't Have Children Now What podcast helps change that. This episode derives from my own experience of trying to conceive a child, which I might add is such a strange encounter with the body. I'll explain that a bit later. So it's my mission to go through hell and high water to not only solve history's infertility medical mysteries, but to help millions of Tudum sisters out there find their place in this world. So stick around. Some things you get over, but infertility and childlessness for me, I just somehow get through. Around three years ago, I was at my lowest point. I was depressed, over 40 and still childless. So I sought help from infertility associations and not one of them had resources to help involuntary childless women. I was so distraught. So I began looking for case studies and infertility medical mysteries to solve my own battle with infertility and decided to create what I wanted to be a part of. Being a sociocultural researcher, I was used to digging around for unanswered questions. But when it came to my own life, I was still clinging to hope of motherhood and desperately wanting to trust doctors' expertise. However, I think there's something about mysteries that intrigues everyone. This urge to solve the puzzle and reveal the truth. We all want an answer, an explanation for the unexplained. Did you know that 50% of infertile women usually don't have a cause identified even after detailed investigations? I'm in that 50% where there was nothing wrong with me medically with all tests coming back normal. But like millions of women, I've struggled with infertility yet my ending wasn't a miracle child, but childlessness. After a 20 year infertility journey, if I must be transparent, I considered my uterus a traitor. So it ended with a misinformed hysterectomy nightmare and my biggest regret. Then I thought to myself, how can I eradicate the rise of childlessness? What are the links to infertility? Why are millions of women like me infertile, barren, and silent? So after spending years performing cutting edge research for top research hospitals and corporations, I went on a quest to break the stigma of female childlessness and solve history's infertility medical mysteries. Then I published an article called My Hidden Grief, Over 40 and Involuntary Childless. I was so afraid to click publish for the world to now know my secret. But what I didn't expect was to receive hundreds of messages all over the world from not only infertile women, but mothers. 
That's when this whole movement really started. This is Marie. What a powerful display of overcoming a silent pain that many women suffer around the world. You may have not birthed a child, but you definitely have birthed new life through this movement. This is Eliza. You held nothing back with your testimony of pain through your journey with infertility. This movement will bring love, inclusion, hope, and healing to many. This is Jill. To take off the mask and expose the hurt takes a lot of courage. You have encouraged me to no longer suffer in silence. Wait, am I actually doing this now? What started as revealing my truth and curiosity to research my own infertility turned into a mission for the truth for millions of women, leading to countless of women not only wanting to support this movement, but seeking answers and help. With great power comes great responsibility. It was time to do some major research on infertility and coping mechanisms to even know what to put out there. The origin of infertility, barrenness, fertility procedures, links to infertility, and its psychological impact, I had to know it all. So I decided to make a podcast to document my research. Mind you, I'm not a podcaster, but I am a researcher. So I was determined to uncover history's infertility medical mysteries. And most of all, I wanted to help the millions of women out there figure out how to cope with childlessness and solve their unexplained infertility. With this harsh reality, I went into meditation and isolation. I used my own possible causes and began researching infertility and involuntary childlessness. But if you want to know the ending, start from the beginning. My first gynecological appointment. I'm a 19 year old college student away from home, lying on my back in the exam room for my first pap smear. A few days later, I returned since the doctor told me that my pap smear came back abnormal. As she performs a quick procedure called cryotherapy that uses freezing gas to destroy precancerous cells on the cervix, the nurse is leaning her elbow on my foot as she attempts to converse with me to ease my discomfort. Her comforting doesn't work. At the end, she says, you may feel hot flashes, so you can leave once they've passed. As soon as they exited the room, I felt a sudden feeling of intense heat over my face, neck, and chest. I was sweating profusely, and I remember feeling scared and alone. When I get back to my dorm, I call my mama. I told her what just happened. She says, why didn't you tell someone? You needed a second opinion. On the other end of the phone, I have the worst migraine and I just begin to sob. Remember when I told you earlier that trying to conceive a child was such a strange encounter with the body? Let me explain. Love and marriage. I meet my future husband in the early spring of 2000 in Atlanta. I'm 25. He's one year older than me and a father of two young sons. Three months later, he proposes. And nine months after our engagement, we marry. Then we immediately start trying to have a child. Because aren't we taught? First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage. So I tell my mom, he tells his mom, they're both ecstatic. But six months later, I'm still not pregnant. I visit my gynecologist and was advised to time the ovulation. Trust me when I tell you, timing ovulation removes all romance from sexual experiences. But I obliged since I was anxious to get pregnant. Then a strange encounter started to happen with my emotions first. I found myself prematurely jumping ahead on planning for the new baby's arrival, buying baby stuff and telling more family and friends that we were having a baby soon. However, when that wasn't happening, I became so ashamed and consumed alcohol to mask my pain. 
Then an even stranger encounter started to happen with my body. There were times when I prayed and prayed so hard that my body misled me into thinking that I was actually pregnant. My period was late for weeks at a time. I had cravings. I was bloated. I was fatigued. My body even tricked me into thinking I was having morning sickness. Each time I call my mama to share my symptoms. Sounds like you're pregnant, she joyfully say. But weeks later, my period returned. I'm here to tell you that nothing was more disheartening than a suspicion of failure every single time I tried to conceive a child with my husband. I felt as though I was inadequate as a wife since the embarrassment pressed on me more and more. So then I was advised by a doctor to take a fertility test called HSG to rule out blockage of my fallopian tubes. But it came back normal. Other women who were mothers would tell me it took them several tries, so not to worry. So I don't obsess and take it easy. But then, a year later, we get divorced. At this point, I assume that it's just God's way of sparing me into single motherhood. Boy, was I wrong. Not long after my divorce, on my way to dinner one evening, I take a detour And I'm now rushed to the emergency room since I feel a sharp pelvic pain and can hardly drive. And for all days, I'm on my period, but not a regular period. Mine equated to flowing heavily like a faucet. The male ER doctor performs a pelvic exam. Due to my extremely heavy menstrual cycle, it looked like a crime scene in there. I was humiliated. He told me that I felt the piercing pain because my ovaries had ruptured. But oddly enough, he brushed it off. Most women's ovaries rupture, but if you happen to feel it, then it's quite painful. He then claimed that was the least of my worries. And what he said next shocks me. You're severely anemic and your blood count is dangerously low. You're on empty and I'm shocked you're still alive. We're going to have to admit you for an emergency blood transfusion. After the blood transfusion, I was given two options. Get pregnant or get on birth control pills to manage my menstrual cycle. Although I was conflicted since the last thing I wanted to do was control birth. But due to being newly single without a partner, my pursuit of motherhood was on hold. So I opted for birth control pills until I found love again. At this point, now in my late 20s, I was still hopeful that I could conceive since doctors continued to assure me that I could, although my intuition told me otherwise. And now a quick break to hear from one of our sponsored affiliates, Booking.com, where our listeners can escape the city and spend your vacation or staycation at adults-only hotels and destinations. Along with Booking.com, we've curated adult-only outings just for you. If you're interested in booking an adults-only trip, whether afar or local, visit www.tutumglobal.com travel for great deals right now. Why is everyone getting pregnant but me? By my mid-30s, I found love again and was still hopeful to become a mother, although I was still living in uncertainty. At this point, it seemed like everyone around me was able to conceive but me, despite feeling ashamed and excluded in a sea of mothers. I had become adept at hiding my secret grief. There was nowhere I could go, work, family, social, without being questioned about if I wanted kids or when I planned on having any. So when I took a break from birth control pills, I masked feeling inadequate as a woman by using the excuse that I didn't have any children since I was on birth control. But the truth was, I didn't know if I could have children. By my late thirties, I had lived through over a decade of fertility tests, monitoring, oral medication, blood tests, trigger shots to induce ovulation, ultrasounds. 
Doctors just could not figure out my fertility issues, stating that all tests were still coming back normal. So now my diagnosis was unexplained infertility. Unexplained infertility is not a magical condition. There is a reason. We just don't know what it is. Unexplained infertility is such a controversial diagnosis. By definition, it's a diagnosis of elimination. But to make matters worse, within a few months apart, I was misdiagnosed with two diseases, lupus due to the hormones from birth control pills affecting my blood results, and sickle cell due to iron deficiency from heavy bleeding. The psychological impact of two misdiagnoses paired with unexplained infertility was terribly difficult to get through with my sanity intact. At this point, menstrual misery and infertility was such a consuming part of my life. I was conflicted that I was created differently than the women around me and questioned the meaning of it all. So I began posing questions on my life on why I existed and how to better cope. As so many unanswered questions intensified my silent grief, one day it finally sunk in. You are never going to be a biological mother. I'd always been uncertain on my failure to conceive but at that moment, my denial of barrenness slowly faded. I decided to accept my truth. However, the years of hope met with heartache left me feeling vulnerable, naked, and judged. However, even after making a conscious decision to accept my truth, that still didn't prevent my feeling of anger and shame that I was infertile. Then to add insult to injury, I felt that my monthly cycle was a cruel reminder that my period would never result in reproduction. Since medications nor procedures were effective in suppressing my menstrual misery, in 2016, I was referred to a doctor for endometrial ablation, which is a procedure to stop or reduce heavy menstrual bleeding. But then the doctor caught me off guard by saying that based on my history of heavy periods, they would likely return. So he recommended a partial hysterectomy to remove my uterus. Grieving over an invisible loss of a child I'd never have was upsetting within itself, but now I was being advised to remove my womb. Merely the thought of ending my fertility journey provoked emotional anguish, but as I reflected, I simply didn't have any fight left in me. So I anxiously told the doctor that I would get the surgery to at least eliminate my physical pain. After the hysterectomy from hell, which I'll discuss in detail in a future episode, I found myself now existing in this world without the life I had imagined, without a child nor a womb. Then I realized that I had put my entire adulthood on hold for my desperate longing of motherhood. So in order to come to terms with involuntary childlessness, I relied on my years in research to delve into even deeper questions and began studying female involuntary childlessness and infertility. From my personal experience and insights, I realized that infertility is too big a part of my life to leave it behind. So I created the National Association of Involuntary Childlessness to perform research studies on what has historically been a silent story of shame. And based on those initial results, I launched Tutum Global, the world's first media company for childless women. As I continue to grasp the raw deal of childlessness, I no longer secretly carry around personal pain. I no longer suppress my hidden trauma by persuading myself that it doesn't measure up against greater tragedies. My experience of being in this progression of healing continues to evolve as I now want to solve the medical mysteries on this unforeseen life circumstance while unearthing the millions of women out there seeking fulfillment beyond childlessness. That's all for today. Thank you for listening to the first episode of I Can't Have Children, Now What? This podcast series is about journeys resulting in childlessness. It's about thinking for yourself 
but also thinking as a community, gathering knowledge from personal experiences, investigating infertility from a woman's perspective, and the healing of women who are childless not by choice and by circumstance. Next on episode two, we'll talk about the curse of the barren woman as we discuss the cultural consequences and religious taboos around barren women and infertility since fifth century BC. So make sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on Apple Podcast or your favorite streaming platform. And follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Chalice Women. From Tudum Global, I'm your host, Joby Tyson. You've just listened to the I Can't Have Children, Now What? podcast with your host, Joby Tyson. If you're enjoying our podcast, tell a friend, family member, or coworker about it. You can support this podcast and get exclusive bonus content, episode transcripts, polls, and more by becoming a monthly patron at ICan'tHaveChildren.com. Thanks for listening.